Right, everyone. How are we doing? You ready? Before I can actually start, I have a couple of statements to make. And these statements will make sure that we're on the same page in regards to the topic of the day. So I've praised you for your interaction. I have to make good on that. So, ladies and gentlemen, do we agree? First, need to enable this button, of course. Do we agree that slow websites suck? Yes. All right, all right, good, good, good. I have three statements. That's one out of three. Good job. Here we go, next one. Do we agree that web performance is an essential part of the user experience? Yes? Come on. Yes. All right, thank you. And do we agree, and that's, that's one of the ones that people usually don't fully agree with, do we agree that a slow website is just as bad as a website that is down? See, same thing. If it's, if it's excruciatingly slow, you're just going to abandon it. If it's down, you're going to abandon it as well. So for me, it's, it's, it's the same ballpark. Now, if this happens, if your website is slow or down, you're going to lose money. It's bad. You're going to lose face, which is also quite bad. And you might even lose a little bit of page rank. Now, a lot of people think then, OK, we have capacity issues. We need to add capacity. They just throw servers at the problem. That's usually the way to go. And I believe it's not a sustainable solution in the long run, because you're a lot of the, either you do capex or opex, capex meaning capital expenditure, you're buying servers, which you might not need once you solve the actual problem, or you start renting extra capacity with cloud vendors, which is going to increase your bill quite a bit. Now, on a short-term basis, when the house is on fire, this is a really good strategy. In the long run, it is not economically viable. And as uh, I have to mention, a lot, there's a couple of people in here who've seen all these jokes before, so I'm looking at you. Please don't spoil it for the rest of us. As uh, the wonderful poet Notorious B.I.G. once said, more money, more servers, more problems. I believe in that. So what any sane person would do then is try to identify the slowest parts. Call that refactoring or optimizing. It might even mean uh, changing things in your stack. It might not all be code. It might be tuning some parameters on your web server, tuning your database, uh, maybe changing the structure of a table. But I have to be honest about that. On a medium, like on a short-term basis, you're going to throw servers at the problem. On a longer-term basis, you're going to optimize. But in the long run, you're going to probably hit the limits. Even like if you're more successful and your capacity increases and your data sets increase, you're just going to throw developer time at it, which is also expensive. Most of you are quite expensive profiles. And after a while, you hit the point of diminishing returns, where the money you pour into it in terms of development time won't result in the, like, the continuous growth of the platform and the continuous stability of, of, of the platform, nor will it increase the or no, nor will it decrease the, the loading times. So what do you do? And that's the entire topic on which this presentation hinges, you cache. So this is basically a caching token. As my t-shirt indicates, I'm only in it for the cache, basically. Uh, I use the metaphor of boxes. Why do I use the metaphor of boxes? Because in my, if I have to explain caching, I always say you pre-compute stuff and you store it in boxes for later use. You don't have to recalculate it or recompute it, because why would you do that? if the data doesn't change. Imagine, let's take PHP for example. You have a script that has to be executed, so what happens first is you send a request to the web server. The web server processes it, allocates a set number of resources to do that. But then it has to pipe it through to PHP FPM probably. So it has to bootstrap that, and we know how PHP loads things. Uh, you have to load your modules, you have to load your runtime. If your PHP caches aren't hot, you're going to have to read files from disk. You're going to have to lex them, compile them, execute the logic. There's probably going to be a framework that needs to be bootstrapped. Most likely, there will be a database that will be used as well. Those queries have to be sent. They have to respond, and it has to take all the way back through the PHP runtime to the web server to the end user. Every single time, even if the data doesn't change. Imagine a WordPress blog. You just go to the home page, it has to process all those resources even if the data doesn't change. That's why caching matters. Still with me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. OK, great. Hi, my name is Thais. I'm, uh, I'm from Belgium, so it's not really that far from me. I'm a technical evangelist at a uh, company called Varnish Software. Uh, who's heard of Varnish Software? It's quite, an, quite a good number. I usually use the joke, there is room for, there's potential here, room for improvement, but quite a number of people know us. 
for the people who don't, we're the company behind the popular open source reverse caching proxy technology called Varnish Cache. And if you draw a blank on that one, it's, it's technology used by about 4.8 million websites, last I counted. And if you look at the top 10,000 of busiest and biggest websites, about 19% uses the technology. Now, not all of it is done in the open source. Uh, you see that with a lot of companies who are built on open source is they have to have a revenue model. And our revenue model is an enterprise uh, solution. Uh, I have some slides on that as well, not in order to sell anything because I'm not a salesperson, I'm a technical evangelist. And we have models that soften the blow a bit. That like, You don't have to pay licenses for specific versions and you can still enjoy the features. And I'll show some of the features. I'm also available on social. You can do that afterwards. I'm on the different social media. Uh, I will use Twitter primarily to share the slides or share insights on the technology. And you can even use Twitter or any other one right here, right now, to heckle me, to banter, to do whatever you want to do. Maybe give me constructive criticism if required. I'm also the author of Getting Started with Varnish Cash, a book about the technology. And as it happens, I have a free copy of the book. Uh, you're probably going to raffle that, Craig. And I have some other swag. I have some the typical bunny stickers uh, by Varnish. I have a bunch of them here. Brought some t-shirts, beanies, and other stuff. So I didn't come empty-handed. Now, Varnish Cash, the technology that I learned to love the last decade. Like, I've only joined Varnish Software last year in March, so it's almost a year. But I've been, I've been using Varnish for a decade when I still worked in Belgium at a hosting company. And it was, I wouldn't call it a silver bullet because we all know that these don't exist, but it came pretty close. It was like the go-to solution whenever someone complained that performance was pretty poor. Now, if you don't use Varnish, and you, this is the regular communication pattern, end user will go to a website that is hosted on this server and there'll be direct interaction. The problem with this approach is when you do this at large scale, then there'll be lots of users. So that means this one has to process a lot each server has limits of what it can do, either in terms of before it gets exhausted or because of limitations on parameters like uh, the Apache or Nginx max connection setting, the max connections on your database. So you, if you'll reach those, then your website will be slow or offline. The trick of varnishes is that, and I didn't mention varnish explicitly, I mentioned the term proxy or reverse caching proxy because we're in that domain where there's other players as well, is that we put ourselves between the user and the server. Now, I should have drawn a dividing line here because we're more at the data center end because in the 90s we had proxy servers as well because connectivity was quite slow, didn't work that well, so we put proxies in our offices to make sure that these images shouldn't be loaded again. Now, the tables have turned and internet is quick and fast and the consequences at the server end, at the data center end, are much bigger. So the proxy server protects the server the origin server, as we call it, from excessive load to too many connections. And uh, we call this an origin shield. That's how it works. Now, uh, if I look into the room, I see a little bit of confusion here. So I wanted to know, are you still on board with this? Does this make sense? Yes. Not everyone nods. So I'm going to throw in this one. Again, right, Christian, one of those jokes. I, I did a presentation on Tuesday in London as well, also about Varnish at a different meetup group. And I always throw in this one. Who knows this movie? Who's seen this movie? Bodyguard. The Bodyguard, indeed. Featuring, let's try this out. Who is this? No, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Which person is this? Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner. And this? Whitney and Whitney Houston. Someone has already spoiled the joke because, indeed, this is your PHP application and this is your caching server. In the movie, Whitney Houston is this superstar, this. Uh, movie star and music star, that's your application, right? That's where the value is. And Kevin Costner was just hired to protect it from stalky fans, stalking fans being the excessive amount of users that bring the load. So when in doubt, think of Kevin and Whitney. Less confused now? I hope I see everyone nodding, right? All right, that's the trick I pull. Now, we'll be talking about caching and not just, you could cache anything basically in an application, but we'll be talking about HTTP caching. And uh, this, like, Everyone who has worked with caching since the late 90s usually associates these kind of headers with browsers. They were originally invented to make sure that browsers would cache. But browser caching is very unreliable because users can flush it and not all browsers process cache control headers, expires headers, and other headers in the same way. So there are specifications out there that differ. So this is the good old expires headers header. It is in this format explicitly when it expires in GMT format. I usually put that out there GMT 
but it's a non-issue because we're in the GMT time zone, so it's quite irrelevant. But I don't really use it ever because it's, it's not easy to use. You always have to think, at what time will it expire? Whereas this is much more controllable. A little test for you people, how long will Varnish cache this one? Excuse me? Damn it, I all, like, you're, but you come from the symphony community, right? Yeah. You, you know this. But a lot of people, this, this is a trap I set wide open. And people look at MaxH, they recognize MaxH, and they say, one hour, 3,600, because they know it. But the people in symphony, because Fabien, the original author of symphony, read the HTTP specification quite thoroughly, and the symphony framework respects all these rules. In fact, SMaxH stands for shared max h and this value 86,400 is a day so whenever Farnish sees this header coming from your application that you have sent or that your web server have sent it will look at this first if it doesn't find as max h it will look at max h if it doesn't find max h it will look for an expire setter if it doesn't find any of that it will default to whatever is set in varnish and by default that is two minutes 120 seconds now, one thing about the HTTP spec is that they're not really consistent. S dash max H, max dash H. Could have done that far better. It's, it's too late now. Now you can also, this is a way, as a developer, this is, I call this developer empowerment. As a developer, you have the tools at your, uh, the tools ready at, at your availability to control the behavior of the cache. You shouldn't really configure the cache in that way because you're already doing it from your application if you play your cards right. And all the modern frameworks, I've been giving Symfony quite a bit of praise. I'm a Symfony user myself, but I see that Laravel does it too. Uh, it is important that you control the headers because that will give you the power and will avoid that you have to talk to sysadmins and people who are at the operational side who unfortunately are always burdened with Varnish. I believe that Varnish is, or reverse caching proxies, any kind, is a responsibility of both developers and ops people. But in reality, it's often shoved over to the operational people. Now, you can control how long it will be cached and how it will be cached. So public means both browsers and shared devices, like proxies. If this would be private, then Varnish wouldn't cache it, but the browser would still be able to cache it. If Varnish sees this, as mentioned, Varnish will cache it for a day, but this header will be forwarded to the browser, and the browser could still decide to do an hour's worth of caching if it is configured that way. On the other end, this is how you can control how things don't get cached. Now, this won't be, be cached either. This is a date in 2017. If Varnish sees either of these, either private, no cache, or no store, it will decide not to cache. Also, if you set a max H to zero, it won't cache either. So these are the things. But this looks straightforward. It's an easy way to control it, but the story isn't done yet. Otherwise, I'm already 12 minutes. I'm only 12 minutes in it. It would be done. There's far more to it. What I like is the vary header. Who has used the vary header before? You say that with a sense of pride. You can be proud about that. Because how do you, let's do a little quiz. How do you identify objects in the cache? What identifies an HTTP response, an object in cache? Anyone? URL. URL, yes, exactly. Uh, in Varnish, that's a combination of the URI and the host name. And if there's no host name set, it will take the server IP. But indeed, the fully qualified URL is the unique identifier of an object in cache. And the problem is, as an application developer, you can depend on other request headers to create variations of the cache. I'll give you an example. If you use the accept language header to create a multilingual website, then you'll be in trouble. Because by default, if you, if you don't set this one, Varnish will just take the first value you have. Let's say you have French and English in there and the first person going to the website is a French person, your application detects the accept uh, language header, uh, notices that there's French in there, will render the French version, and Varnish will just naively cache it. And then an English-speaking person will go there, and it won't make sense, and that will have a bad effect on, on the user experience. So as an application developer, it is your responsibility to set that header if you depend on it. The value, so vary header is a response header, but the value of vary should be a request header that is set. So accept language is something that your browser sends. Mind you, you have to do some tweaking with that because I'm not sure if anyone has seen uh, accept language headers that have been sent. It's not like French or English, it's just a, a list, just like user agent, a wild list of all sorts of values. So you might want to clean that up a bit. You can do that in Varnish. Another aspect of caching 
that, that, that makes it rather difficult is state. State, it sucks. State sucks. And why, uh, why do we need state, anyone, as related to HTTP? Because HTTP is a stateless protocol. But still, we need state. Otherwise, if we navigate to a page twice, it has to remember certain things. How do we keep track of state? I, have, I need two, two values here. Cookies. cookies, yes. Session. Sessions is also cookies, most of the time. There are old school examples in PHP where the session ID is a query string parameter, but let's not go there. Uh, any other way of keeping track of state? Headers. Headers, yeah, headers, but that's a bit tough. Yeah, I'll just spoil it. Authentication header. It's also state, right? It's because the idea behind state is it's user-specific data, so it means it's for your eyes only. And that applies to both cookies, because cookies can allow you to create personalized versions based on individual cookies or just a reference to the PHP session ID. But authentication headers do the same. It implies that whatever you're seeing is for your eyes only. And caches don't like that. By default, any cache I know, as soon as it sees an authentication header, or an authorization header rather, and a cookie, it will stop caching. Now, who doesn't use cookies in his or her website? Who does not? Come on. No hands? So everyone uses cookies. Of course we do. Now, even if someone would raise their hand, I'd say if you use Google Analytics, you use cookies. It's, it's, it's out there. So if, if we add those facts, that means that Varnish can't cache any website. And yet 4.8 million people at least use it. So that means there's a way around it. And the way around it, and that's the unique power, I believe, and I'm not saying that as a representative of the company, but rather as a, someone who likes the technology, is the Varnish configuration language. Who has played with VCL, as we call it before? Again, with, with great sense of I'm, I'm proud about that myself. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of VCL. Now, VCL, before I show you the code, stands for Varnish configuration language, and it's a DSL, a domain-specific language. It's curly braces style, looks a bit like Perl, PHP, uh, C, whatever we're using. But the idea is that if you write a script in VCL and you attach it to Varnish, when Varnish boots up, it will parse that code and will compile it to C and will attach it as a shared object. So it's super, super fast. So everything associated with Varnish is all built for performance and scalability. Uh, we don't make compromises on that. If we have to add features and it will increase loads on the different workers, on the different threads, the, the client threads, then we don't do it. Let me show you a little bit of VCL. It is related to state. This is a way, this is the old school way, this is the ugly way of eliminating certain cookies. So what we do in here is, this is VCL rec v. This is a subroutine you can hook into. So VCL is not a programming language that you can use to do regular top-down programming. It's actually a language that hooks into the finite state machine of Varnish. So there's this flow going through Varnish from receiving a request to delivering a response to fetching stuff from the back end, from hits, misses, and so on and so forth. And you can extend the behavior. There's default behavior, but by writing VCL, this piece, you actually extend the behavior. I told you a couple of minutes ago that Varnish doesn't cache when there's cookies involved. So what we do here, we hook into the receiving logic, so that means whenever a request comes in from the client and it reaches us, we're looking if the request object has an HTTP value and the cookie header associated with that if it exists. So that means, is there a cookie? If, there, if that is the case, it will do some substitution magic using regular expressions. But the magic behind it all is it will remove every single cookie except these right here. So whenever it sees a sess cookie or, or whatever, it could be PHP sess it default value, it will keep that and all the rest it will remove. So that means uh, if, if, you're not, if you don't have the session cookie ready, like that means if the user hasn't logged in, we'll strip off all cookies, even the tracking cookies. And tracking cookies aren't really important for your origin server because usually these typical tracking cookies will be processed by the JavaScript that is loaded at the client side. So it's actually the browser that processes them. So you can actually strip them away quite safely without interrupting the, the business logic of your application. And so what happens if we do the find and replace and we end up with an empty cookie, we just strip off the cookie. And if we end up with cookies, which means it's either this pattern that pattern or the no cache cookie, then we return pause. And return pause means we do not want to serve it from cache. We pause it. 
Otherwise, we do return lookup, which we'll look it up in cache. So we do quite explicit logic to bypass the cache, only if there's cookies involved. If there's no cookies involved, you'll exit right here, and it will default to default logic. What you can also do, this is what makes it really interesting. Let's say you're not using session cookies, but you have this splash page on your website where you do language or territory selection. And as soon as you click a language that you want, it will save it in the language cookie. Now, I've told you that cookies are more or less the enemy. Right here, we're using cookies to our advantage. So same logic, we're receiving a request. If there's cookies, we'll remove all cookies except the language cookie. And we'll do the exact opposite in the, than in the previous example. If the request object has an HTTP object that has a cookie request header, so that means if the browser has a cookie and it matches, so that's the tilde sign, that's a regular expression match, if it matches a collection of empty strings, that means the cookie was replaced. If the cookie was replaced in the previous example, we decide to cache. But right here we we'll do the exact opposite because we don't want any caching if there's no cookie set because we want to show the, the splash page for the, let's say you go to the home page, you want to show the splash page. So we return pass. Otherwise, we'll just create a hash and look it up. But here is where it gets interesting. This is the expression where we extend the behavior of the lookup. So I asked you, how do you identify something in cache? You responded URL, which is absolutely correct. And I could show you, I don't have it in my slides, how the default behavior is. But what we're doing is we're adding a piece to it. So we're using the hash data function to extend the hash. So the hash contains the host name and the URI. What we're doing here is taking the value, doing a find and replace, taking the language value out of it. So all of a sudden, you're leveraging the cookie to create a multilingual website that has multiple variations in the cache. We could be smarter about this. We're accept accepting any value, but we could mention the languages we want to keep a tighter control because if users are clever enough and they modify the cookies, they could create so many variations that the cache fills up and then you just have a cache stampede and a really low hit rate. So these are various ways we deal with state, with personalized data. There's a cleaner way of doing this. Uh, in, there is a, a, a collection of VMODs out there. VMODs stand for varnish modules. And these are just modules that wrap around logic third-party libraries. Uh, basically, everything that is written in C can be extended. So you can build your own library there. So what this one does is we're importing a piece of uh, a module here that does cookies. Uh, it's called Cookie Plus. This is an, an enterprise module, but we also have Vmod Cookie out there in the wild, uh, which behaves in a similar way, which might be packaged in future Varnish versions for you to use. The fun thing about this is you don't need this ugly mumbo jumbo anymore. You can actually just say, we're just going to keep the language cookie, I'm going to write the value, which is, you have to admit, a lot more sensible than all these ugly regular expressions. And in the end, we can just use a getter to get the language cookie out there. Similar situation. All of a sudden, we've solved that problem. But there's more problems coming our way. Imagine this setup. You have a header, a main page, a footer, and a navigation. And this is cacheable, this is cacheable, footer is cacheable, but right here, we're going to put in some user information. How would we tackle that? Like, because if we have that in a single HTTP response, there'll be no cache. So how do we solve that? How do we tackle that? There's various ways. I'm just curious how far your imagination stretches. Each side includes. Yeah, that would be a way. That's definitely a way, a good way. Any other ones? Ajax. Come again? Ajax. Ajax, yeah, yeah. Can we get a little bit more old school things? Things we did in the 90s? Frame frames, yes, or iframes. I was really hoping for that. <laughs> and what else do we have? Similar to edge side includes. The old way. Server side includes. Who remember server side includes? Who's old enough to remember those? Yeah, see, server side includes did the job back in the day. Now all of these, every single one of them, falls under the same category, category of placeholders. These are all placeholders. You just put a marker there, placeholder, and say, here is where content will come later on. But we'll just present it as a single HTTP response, and the rest will happen either at the client side, at the server side, or as edge side includes imply, at the edge. Now the edge is the outer tier of your application, usually your reverse caching proxy or your CDN, which is basically the same thing. 
So what we want to do in the end is create a separate HTTP request for this. Because HTTP has no notion of different blocks, you have to apply trickery for that. And yes, Ajax is a way to do this. So thank you for that, that's the number one. There's advantages to it. The fact that it's client-side makes it easy because it's written in JavaScript. JavaScript is very tangible for most web developers. It is within the domain of expertise that people have. The funny thing is it's parallel processing if you want that. So you can load multiple ones in parallel. And there's this sense, and it's a really expensive term, graceful degradation. Graceful degradation means if something goes wrong, let's say you have three frames you want to load, if one of them fails, you just don't load that content. Maybe it's a widget on your website. Instead of blowing up your entire page, you just lose 10%, 20%, 30%, maybe 50% of your logic, but the rest is still available. That's what graceful degradation is. It could fail softly. There's some clear downsides. <laughs> the same upside is a downside. It is happening at the browser, so it's pretty much beyond your control. You don't know what client people are using. It also, in, it also makes sure that you have extra round trips. And round trips are pretty bad for performance, especially, I think, if, if you're not on, who's not on Wi-Fi here with their phone? Probably have a pretty shitty 3G connection in this basement. Extra round trips will kill you. This is an excellent use case of that. And it is somewhat slower, because you're depending on the connection speed of the end user. Usually I'll ask, are there other solutions? But we already had them. Someone said edge side includes ESI. This is what an ESI tag looks like. This is what you render in your, uh, in your HTTP code, in your HTML, in your JSON, in whatever. This is just a placeholder. And the source attribute mentions the endpoint that should be loaded in, in this tag. And Varnish supports that. And a bunch of CDNs support that as well. It's really good. It's a placeholder. It's parsed by Varnish. And the output then could be a true composition of blocks, which HTTP by default doesn't have. And the advantages continue. You have state per block and TTL per block. Like this is a separate route. If you can control that route and say cache control smax h500, then this will be cached for 500 seconds. Or maybe you say, maybe this is the place where the user information or the shopping cart is loaded, and then it's no cache, no store, or private. And this bit is not cached, whereas the rest is cached. So you still have a decent performance on your application. This is how you do this. And this comes directly from Symfony. This is inspired by Symfony. Fabien, the inventor of Symfony, looked up the spec and noticed that surrogate capability and surrogate controls are an excellent handshaking procedure to see if you can support it. I'll go further. Symfony has that built in. There's a twig bridge for Symfony, right? I'm looking at you guys because you seem to be the expert on that matter. That does negotiation based on that. So what Varnish does, it basically announces in this VCL, it sets a custom request header. This did not come from the client. When we connect, connect to the origin, it seems as though there's an extra request header. And the request header is called surrogate capability. And we mentioned ESI in the key name. Basically, we're mentioning to the application, hey, we support ESI. So if you want to use it, by all means. And if the application notices that and replies back, we expect it to reply with surrogate control. So basically what's happening here is the application saying, if you're, you have surrogate capability, well then I'll have surrogate control. Again with this ESI tag matching. And then we'll remove that header because to the end user it doesn't really matter, it doesn't add value. But more importantly, we're gonna enable ESI parsing. Because this is a little bit CPU intensive, you're not gonna enable this all the time. So we're just gonna put that out here, set it to true, and then you're done. And I think the ESI, or the, the twig bridge for Symfony already supports it. So you have a render ESI function that will do that negotiation for you. Uh, and if it fails, if, if it doesn't notice that surrogate capability header, it will just fall back to an internal sub request and you're safe. And that's what you should do, even if you're not using Symfony, even if, if you don't use the framework or other frameworks, or even, God forbid, you invented your own framework, then, uh, <laughs> then you could uh, still do that negotiation yourself. It's a fail safe. So you built that support in, so you actually have forward compatibility in case you're sitting behind a varnish or a CDN that supports it or not. Now ESI, who uses ESI? I want to see a show of hands. See? That's my point. That's the exact point. It is, what's the downside here? It's not that common. Not a lot of people use it. Now the cool thing is it's server side. It's standardized. It's an, an official W3C standard. And it's processed on the edge. It's a lot faster. It is within your domain of responsibilities. You're not 
sending that responsibility off to the end user to a client that is beyond your control. And because it happens at the data center, it's usually a lot faster. But by default, it's sequential. We have a, we've built a module for our clients in the enterprise version that does this in parallel. But still, there's no graceful degradation. So as soon as one of them fails, your entire page blows up. 503, backend not available. And who's heard of that? Who's used Varnish before? Who heard about guru meditation? Keep your hands raised. <laughs> uh, this, is actually, this is actually the guru that is meditating. That's the, the little sticker. So whenever you see guru meditation on any website, it's usually associated with an HTTP 503 error, and that's Varnish bailing out. If you want stickers at the end, I have a couple there. So we've transitioned from not being able to cache anything to being able to deal with state and authorization, creating placeholders. So at this point in time, this is where the usual Varnish user ends its journey and accepts whatever happens. And in most cases, that will do. Your performance will be a lot better than not having cache, even if some parts of the application are stateful. But this talk is called caching the uncacheable, so we have to go to the next level. This is it. Non-cacheable routes will still be targets for load and latency. Meaning that the parts that have no cache, no store, private, whatever, will still cause load on your system. And maybe a disproportionate amount that depends on the use case. Luckily, Varnish is not just a take it or leave it cache. Because that's what we've been doing. Either we're caching or we're not caching. But we can take it to the next level. Because one of our clients once said, uh, at a meeting, and I love that, and I reuse that term, you're an HTTP logic box, you're more than a cache. And that's what I'm going to show you. What we're going to do, I've talked about the edge before, we're going to make decision making at the edge. So I treated, up until now, Varnish as an origin shield, which it very much is, but we're going to make the decisions here that are otherwise not made elsewhere. Because the problem is with the reason why you need state, the re reason why you need cookies, is to do a personal calculation to present a page that is very specific to the user that you're serving. If you're doing that, caching is not possible. Maybe some of these calculations, some of these computations can be done on the edge so that this page can be cached. And I'll show you how we can do that. It's a bit more advanced and it involves uh, lots of VCL code, but hey, we're developers, we like seeing code on screen, am I right? All right, let's do it. What we can do as well is use synthetic HTTP. Now this will take me some time to go through these slides. Now the problem with putting things on a slide is you actually read it and you stop listening to me, so we'll see how we fare. I'm going to explain the situation to you. I've built this application in PHP using Symfony. Uh, I think it's on GitHub somewhere, but it doesn't really matter right now. And what we're doing is we're storing the username. Like if you use the default Symfony authentication mechanism, you will be able to log in using like a login field, and then the value will be saved in the session storage in a specific format. What you can easily do in PHP and in Symfony as well is to use Redis as your session store because that will make it distributed. If you have multiple web servers and you have a distributed cache, that will allow you to, from all these different servers, have one source of truth where your session state will be stored. What I will do now in this example is to read the username, determine if you're logged in or not, without doing it in PHP. All of that will happen in Varnish by accessing Redis. Now mind you, Varnish is blazing fast, Redis is also blazing fast. If you join those, there's limited performance penalty. And we're doing this synthetically. So what is gonna happen? We need a cookie module, we need the Redis module, and we're gonna use something called Synth Backend. Now, a normal backend in Varnish, that's just your web server, your PHP server, your wherever your code is. Synthetic backends actually pretend that they're backend. And you just inject a string in it, and Varnish will load that string, serve it, and store it in memory so that for the next hour, two hours, a day, whatever you determine, it will be stored in cache. So you're actually fooling Varnish in a way by injecting stuff synthetically, things that didn't come from the origin. We're setting up a Redis connection. This came from my Docker container, so that is the host name of the Redis container, the default port, a bunch of parameters. Now here we go. Varnish, by default, does not have variables. We're looking into if, if we actually need them, but the convention is that we use headers to transport values. So we're setting up a request header, a custom header, that says that we're not logged in by default. 
And we're going to get the cookie plus, we're going to use the cookie plus module to fetch the PHP session ID. We need to know what the ID is. If that cookie is not set, the value is guessed. And we'll store that in the X session header. As I mentioned, this is what we use as variables. If the session is not a guess, that means we have a session ID that probably, I put the emphasis on probably, means that the user is logged in and a valid authenticated user. But we're not going to take the cookie's value as, as a guarantee. We're actually going to dive into Redis and execute an exists command on the session ID with the sf underscore s prefix. That's what Symfony does. That's where your session data is going to be stored. If the reply comes back with one, that means there is a session in the session storage. So that means that user exists. And then we set it to true. So this is advanced logic that we're doing on the edge, things that your PHP application would usually do, but that would make this interaction uncacheable. Ready to take it to the next level? Here we go. Whenever we fetch, let's say you have an endpoint, a slash session endpoint that you would load via Ajax in your application, and that would load the username in JSON, you would process that in JavaScript to, to render the username there. Well, we're intercepting that. The backend fetch hook is what happens in the flowchart in the dynamic flow of Varnish before we actually send the request to the backend. We're intercepting that. We're saying, if the backend request brec.url, so the URL of the backend request equals slash session, then we're not going to send it to the backend. We're going to do some logic ourselves. If you're not logged in, based on that check we did earlier on, we're going to load an empty JSON object as a synthetic backend and then fetch it. So that means Varnish will fetch that value, will store it, and serve it. That means if you're not log in, logged in, you're seeing an empty JSON object. There's different ways of approaching this. This was the one that required the least amount of code. And then you stop. You stop doing this. This is where you exit. If that's not the case, if you are logged in, this is where it gets a lot of fun. We're going to send Lua code to Redis, because Redis supports Lua. So all of a sudden, you could program in Redis. We're doing an evil command, which is just as evil in PHP. You have to have tight control over everything that is happening. And we're pushing all this code. What this does is it will get a key. Now, we're not putting literals in here. We're injecting values through the push function. Because if we, if we do it this way, we can compile this script and use it later on and inject the values later on. It's like a prepared statement in MySQL. So it will get a key, which implies that we're getting a session key, the full session. And then if that session equals nil, if you can't find it, again, we'll return an empty JSON object. But if we do find it, we're going to perform all kinds of ugly regex substitution. And in the end, we're going to fetch the username. This is how we get the username. If the username is nil and not set, again, empty JSON object. But here is where it gets really interesting. If it turns out we have a username, we're going to parse a custom JSON string, which is the username. So all of a sudden, we've intercepted that logic. And we, in Varnish, using the power of Redis, can return the username that was stored in the PHP session storage. We're injecting the session ID value that comes from the cookie. We're executing it. We're taking the reply from Redis. And we're storing it in Varnish so that the next x amount of seconds and minutes, Varnish will serve that directly from cache. Now it gets even more interesting. Because this is intercepted, we have to give it the, the, the metadata as well so that Varnish knows how to deal with it from a caching point of view. So we're intercepting it when the response supposedly comes back. This is where Varnish thinks, OK, this was the backend reply. But again, this was all done synthetically. So if the backend request URL equals slash session, then we're going to give it a content type and a char set. We're going to give it a TTL. We're going to cache this endpoint for an hour. And more importantly, we're going to use the X session header that we set right here as its variation. So all of a sudden, in cache, you're going to create a cache variation for each value. This is not really in line with what I told you about keeping up a high hit rate. But again, this is not so bad. If the cache fills up, Varnish will empty it using the LRU algorithm, which stands for least recently used. So the object that has the least amount of hits is going to be thrown out of the cache to make space for new ones. And again, I told you, this logic, executing this logic, isn't really that heavy on load. Because I told you, Varnish is fast and Redis is fast. But still, it's an optimization of storing it in cache. So this is the summary of is what's going to happen to the user. The user is going to go for the slash session endpoint, expecting JSON to come back. 
it will identify its session, and Varnish will just reply with this. This is the end result, username taste. Usually you should do this in PHP. Usually your application wouldn't be able to be cached. Now we're doing this on the edge. What do you want to do with it? You could perform an AJAX call with that. You will, a zero cost AJAX call, so to speak. It's very powerful. So all of a sudden, that placeholder data you're, not, you're loading is not going to affect your performance. Uh, of course, there's a disclaimer around this. This should only be done for simple business logic. You can't really take all of your application logic out of it. For things that are pretty straightforward, and this would be a great solution. Or you can load it via ESI and process it via local JavaScript so that you don't have to do a round trip at the client side. Or, and, and this is where we're going to, you can use a module we developed called Edge Stash. Edge Stash is mustache on the edge. Who uses mustache? Who uses twig or blade? That's PHP's incarnation of mustache syntax. Basically, it's just these curly braces and then values that should be replaced. Again, I'm introducing you to a new kind of uh, placeholder format. And edge stash is what we process on the edge. So basically, long story short, you can take unparsed twig handles, twig variables, send them to us, and we'll process them on the edge. So all of a sudden, that username field, you just put curly braces instead of edge stash username, and we'll handle it. And we'll take the endpoint, the session endpoint, and we'll parse it in. Allow me to show you. We're importing the edge stash module, and then we're setting up some logic here. Like if we know that the slash session endpoint is used, and JSON will come back, you've seen that in the previous example, we're already going to index it. We're going to decompose the JSON and store the different values in memory so that we can replace this on the fly whenever we get the actual value. If we get the home page back, then we need to find the placeholders where we need to parse these values in. And the power lies in the delivery. So every time we deliver something on the fly, we'll replace it. So let's make it a bit more sensible. Backend response is the place where the backend responds to varnish and where the response will be stored in cache. So what we're doing here prior to storing in cache is either decomposing the HTML and looking for the placeholders or taking the JSON values, the stateful data, and already decomposing these into values as well. And it's only at delivery time that we're going to take that slash session endpoint that we just had, take the values out of it, and replace them on the fly. Now, as an end user, you don't really see much about that because you'll see the username come out really, really fast. And you've seen in the previous example that it happens at, I wouldn't call it zero cost, but at a very, very low performance cost. And then you just execute it, and this is your HTML page with an unparsed username handle. On the other end, we have slash session, where the stateful data is, username taste, and Varnish will turn this into that. This goes a little bit beyond, maybe it goes even far beyond whatever ESI can do. But this doesn't offer you a whole lot of flexibility, because a lot of this is hard-coded. So what you can do is actually, this is something I invented, I would call it an invention, just a little bit of a brain fart there, is uh, you can leverage all that surrogate control stuff that Symfony does behind the scenes in your application for ESI. But instead of ESI, maybe you could say edge stash and then a value. And how do you, there's no source attribute like you had in those edge side includes. What you can do is use a link header, for example. Link headers exist for that reason, to, to give metadata to, to tell the browser or, or any HTTP client where it can find certain resources. Well, I created a rel, a relationship is edge stash, and the endpoint can be, find here, can be found here. And then you can write VCL to do so. Like, we can interpret that. We can interpret at the backend response header. We can uh, use a collect, head, collect function. What collect will do is take separate HTTP responses and collapse them into a single comma delimited string. So you have maybe multiple places where that happens. You can have multiple link headers. And then we're, uh, we're going to look into those link headers and find the ones, find the URLs where the relationship equals edge stash. You perform a really ugly, ugly regular expression substitution call. And at the end of the line, you'll have a collection of comma-separated URLs that are stored here. Maybe you have a header and a footer that are stateful, and that require you to go to endpoints where you can find the data. 
And in the end, if we see that there is a surrogate control header coming back from the application, we're going to parse it. And at delivery time, instead of just, I'm going to show you the first one, where I did add JSON URL, and this is a JSON endpoint. What we do here is add JSON URL CSV. So it can take multiple values from all over, parse them, send them out. And I've built something in Symfony and Twig to do so. I've built a composer package that allows you to do that. You do composer require tastefreen edge stash twig bundle. And this is what you can do. All that complicated VCL is stored in there. And all the logic, all the negotiation is built into the, to the bundle. So the only thing you need to do in your PHP application, in your Twig template, is use the edge stash function that I've developed. And this is the name of the variable you're going to drop in there. This is what's going to be output as unparsed uh, Twig. And this is the endpoint. So this will be injected into your link header. That's all you have to do. Like, this is where you find state. This is what needs to be replaced. Farnish will handle it. Your Symfony application will just output it. The template itself, being username, will be cacheable for however long you want. And everything else will be parsed on the fly. Now, I've also developed it as a, as a filter. So let's say you have a username variable in your PHP uh, logic that you parse into Twig. If there is, because this does the negotiation with surrogate capability and surrogate control, so if it turns out you're not sitting behind an edge stash aware varnish, it will just let that value true and parse it internally. So you have a fallback, basically. But if it turns out you are sitting behind varnish, that supports edge stash includes. Again, this logic is exactly the same. The username will be sent out unparsed, and the session will be sent out as a link header with the custom rel, and then varnish will parse it, send it out on the fly. I even created a little if function that does this negotiation for you. So if you want to have explicit logic there, you could say if edge stash is supported, then you have that edge stash logic. And otherwise, you have your regular twig, twig logic. But did you know that mustache, so the, the parent language, also has loops and if statements in there? It goes a little bit beyond what we're used to. So there will be some confusion. I'm going to try to help you here. What we will do here is add more than just a variable. We'll emit more than just an unparsed value. We'll emit control, conditionals, and loops. So what this does is emit a hash, so curly braces, hash username. So if the username property exists, then you can say welcome username. Else, if there's, an, if there's no username, welcome guest. This will not be processed by PHP. This if statement will be sent to edge stash. That is logic, that is typical mustache logic. You can even do loops. If the endpoint, the slash users endpoint, contains multiple users in JSON format, it will iterate over each one and will look for the username and emit them as a list. And again, this is done on the edge. This is not done by your PHP application. So this is pretty powerful stuff to make your application cacheable. Not all of this is in the open source. A lot of this is in our enterprise version. But again, I told you in the beginning, my goal is not to sell you our solution. It's not my job. I just want to show you what technology is out there, both in open source and enterprise. And we have some uh, images in the different cloud platforms on the marketplace where you could use our technology without paying for a license. So we have prepackaged Varnish Cache, the open source version, which are, is already set up for AWS, Azure, and GCP. And we're probably going to be adding platforms there that allows you to play around with it. But there's also an equivalent from Varnish Enterprise with all the little bit of bells and whistles that are part of that. So by all means, try that out. There's free trials. If you need feedback, get in touch with me. I'll, I'll show you how that technology works. And there might be, as, as time evolves, open source equivalents from within the community. But right now, we're, we're taking those modules that you've seen, modules like Edge Stash and Cookie Plus, Synth Backend, we're developing them ourselves, we're packaging them, we're maintaining them. This is basically what we do. This is part of our revenue model. But let's show you a little bit more edge side decision making. This was just a way of showing you the username without having any slowdown in your application. But you can do more, like uh, device detection, for example. We have this uh, device atlas. If you have a device atlas license, you can detect whether or not the username is a mobile phone or not. And you can do cache variations on that level. Or you can do geo-blocking, which is also interesting. If you have the MaxMind database file, 
you can inject that here, the typical one that uh, associates IPs with their geographical information. And then we can take the country name when we receive a request from the client's IP address. And we store it in a country name header. And if it's different from Belgium or the Netherlands, we stop executing and return a 403 error. Sorry, this content is only available in Belgium and the Netherlands. Or uh, Belgium and Germany, rather. Let's continue. We're almost there. This is the last example before I end. We can also use link headers. And we already do that. Like, who, who uses HTTP version 2 and has already done like, server-side push, that kind of stuff? It's very popular where you use the link header to say, I'm going to push you these resources and it's going to be automatically loaded. What we're doing is prefetch. So we're using that same syntax. So if you have a link header that contains prefetch or next, and then these tags where the URL is inside, it's probably going to be your CS, uh, CSS file or a JavaScript file. We can already take that and send an HTTP call to it to already load it in another sub request. So within Varnish, we're firing off a request to your web server for the value that is in here, your CSS file, your JavaScript file, your web fonts, whatever, and already put it in the cache because we're knowing that in the next couple of milliseconds, the server is just going to request it. And if you have lots of visitors, this will have a significant impact on your performance. You're already anticipating your next move. So that's all I have to tell you. It's been primarily about making decisions on the edge. And I hope by now, you've realized that edge side decision making can make uncacheable things cacheable. And that's the topic. So thank you for staying around. Thank you for not running away. Thank you for not falling asleep entirely. <laughs> Cheers. And I still have a book to raffle. We'll figure that out in the end. Uh, Again, I have stickers and other stuff. Thank you for checking me out. See you next time. Do you have any questions? Or? Question. I already dodge. I usually dodge questions, but this is a meetup, so yeah, questions are I, in order. Five, five minutes of questions. Well, I have all the time in the world, so it doesn't really we matter. Don't, we don't have the room. But a lot of people. <laughs> well, like like the reason I'm gonna. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna tell you why we uh, why I usually skip Q and A because a lot of people don't really have the guts to ask their question. They're a bit shy, or people. Uh, give responses that aren't applicable to anyone. So usually I say come to the bar, but since we're in a friendly environment and have a bit of time, I would yeah, happily... I'm already here. Um, so in, in my company, we have uh, an EC2 box running uh, yep. Varnish. Um, and you mentioned AWS. Yes. So, so how easy would it be for us to migrate to the AWS offering? What's the AWS offering called? What can I throw at my SRE guy tomorrow and say, check this out? Super easy. You go to your, so you go to your EC2 instances. You click a new one. Instead of my AMIs, you just go to marketplace. You type in Varnish. You'll see our images. You load them. We already pre-configured them, so Varnish is installed. It's listening on the right ports, and you just attach your load balancer to it, and you're done. Both for cache and enterprise. Okay, great. And I can still do the Lua stuff and, and everything. Yeah, yeah, all of that, all of that. Uh, the only thing that is not in there, that Redis one, is an open source module by a guy named Carlos Abalde. He's uh, also a guy who's very much involved with Varnish, but it's on GitHub, so you can compile it in there, so your SRE guys should have a little build script that take the source, do some uh, configure, make, make install, and that will be, next time you bootstrap Varnish, that Redis will be readily available for you. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, by all means, do so. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for, the, for your talk, it was really... Thank you for your enthusiasm. I, I saw you were very interactive, so I appreciate that as a speaker. My question would be, uh, if, if the Varnish is having any kind of solution for geo, geocaching. For example, like if someone is coming from Micronesia, you don't want to serve, you don't want to serve the content that is in Vanish server in the UK or in North Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to help you with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an example of the presentation I did on Tuesday because I added such an example. So just give me a second and I'll show you exactly that. Here we go. This is the example. So imagine you have a US backend, a UK backend, and a Belgium backend because I'm Belgium. And then this is where your GOIP database is going to be loaded. It's going to be your MaxMind DB based on the licensing you have with them. And at the receiving end, we're going to get the country code from the client IP. It will read it from the database. And then here's the logic. If the country code is US, then you point your backend, so backend hint, 
to US, which is this one, this host name. If it's GB, then you're in the UK, you load this backend, and otherwise you'll just fall back to this one. So this allows you to do the same thing geo-routing. But I actually put in a request to have a, a sort of director, as we called it, which is, which is our load balancing mechanism, to do that automatically without having to write explicit code. That's not out yet. That's just a request of mine that I put in last week. So yes, it's possible. Anyone else? Go ahead. Thank you. I've never used Farnish directly myself, but um, have you uh, ever applied this pattern to like, more microservices where you've got like client-side load balancing going on, where one service is talking to another, or you might have several instances of the same service yeah. talking to another service? Well, definitely, and Varnish is pretty lightweight on that matter, and as you can see here in this example, you can route to different backends, so you can route from one service to another, so all that logic is here. So this is basically, Varnish is basically a load balancer itself, so you could use that in your different microservice to cache a little bit of logic, and then have these talk to one another uh, in a cached way, and these backend definitions, and if you look at the documentation of Varnish, you'll also find something about directors, which is our load balancing uh, tool which allows you to say I want to talk to these microservices that are hosted same microservice on different locations and do round robin or hashed based or uh, random weighted random least connections you name it so yes that is possible but I don't have a ready to use example for you unfortunately but if you have if you want to know just contact me late contact me later on and happy to point you in the right direction thank you I think we have one more question. I'll still be. Will I be there? <laughs> yeah, or is there a pub? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, then I'll, I'll last stick, question. stick around. Very, very last question. Yeah, so we cache only when we have a real user. What about the uh, warming the cache? Excuse Getting me, come again? What about the warming the cache? You can warm up the cache quite easily by just running a script. So let, let's say you're warming up the cache. Maybe you have multiple instances uh, of the cache and you want to bring in a new cache, new cache item in there. So what you want to do is before you put it behind your load balancer, you could run a bunch of URLs on it, maybe via a bash script, and Varnish will just load those and fire them up. There is even a way of doing this within the Varnish ecosystem. You have binaries like uh, Varnish log that allows you to read logs, but you can also record scenarios with that. So you, you play a scenario, look, send a bunch of requests to Varnish, capture those with the log tool, and uh, serialize them to disk, and have that file with you, and just use that to bootstrap new Varnishes, to warm up Varnish caches. In our enterprise version, we also have a storage compartment, like a, a actual storage on disk. You can take these files, bootstrap them in Varnish, and preload the cache. We even have a thing called VTC, which is a unit testing tool for Varnish, which allows you to warm up the cache as well if you want to. Many ways of doing it, but ideally before you put this Varnish server in your load balancer, send some requests to it, maybe from a, a prepared script that has maybe your loaded sitemap XML into it and just have it ready to use. Now, our enterprise version, also in the cloud, I want to always mention the cloud because it's the cheapest way to play with the technology. We also have a high availability module that allows Varnish to cluster itself. So it will replicate it to multiple nodes. So what happens then is you can put a new one in and VHA, Varnish high availability, will synchronize items from the cache there. It's also a possibility. I really hope that answers your question. If not, find me in the bar. <laughs>